Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Modify Findings presentation. A particular welcome for all the participants to the Modify study who are joining us today. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, and you can post your questions using the chat function throughout the whole webinar. It's a nice sunny day in Oxford, which is unusual. And I am Principal Clinical Scientist, Helena Tomides Briers. I have the pleasure of being joined today by Professor of Medicine at Liverpool University, Dan Cuthbertson, and Endocrinology Consultant at the Oxford University Hospitals, Gaia Thanabalasan Singham. Um, I will now hand you over to Gaia, who will start the webinar for us. Gaia, over to you. Thanks, Helena. So it's my great pleasure to say thanks to everyone that's joining us and also thanks because I expect most of you are people that took part in this study and we couldn't have you know, done this study without you. And thanks for joining us. So I'm going to just briefly talk about type 2 diabetes and I'm expecting that most people on this call will be living with type 2 diabetes. So we'll be aware that type 2 diabetes essentially is associated with having high blood glucose levels and type 2 diabetes is the major cause of diabetes. And in this condition, people are not making enough insulin and the insulin that they're making is not as effective um, in, in this condition, which leads to the high blood glucose levels. And unfortunately, also is associated with a high um, degree of complications associated with diabetes so that we know that people who have type, type 2 diabetes are at increased risk of developing complications to do with their kidneys and that's one of the things that we screen for so you'll be invited every year to have your urine looked at for protein and also blood tests to look at your kidney function and we know that a significant majority of people who sadly end up needing um, dialysis or transplants will have diabetes as the underlying cause for their kidney failure. We also know sadly that diabetes is associated with an increased risk of heart disease and, um, and still remains a major uh, cause of death in people with type 2 diabetes. And we also know that type 2 diabetes is associated with um, problems in other organs, including the liver, which is something that we'll hear about more today. Now, the good news is that we know that people can manage this condition uh, through diet and lifestyle changes. And we also are fortunate that we now have at our fingertips a huge array of um, therapeutic or medications available to help people control their diabetes and reduce the risk of developing these complications to do with type 2 diabetes. But one of the things that we wanted to look at in this study was whether there were other techniques or other avenues that would help clinicians and people looking after people with diabetes identify whether there were certain groups of people that might be at increased risk of developing these complications and whether we can use newer technologies like MRI scans to help identify which patients might benefit from some of the um, newer and more uh, aggressive medications um, to help treat not only but also their complications. So in this study, Modify, we invited people with type 2 diabetes, mostly from community or looked after by their general practitioners, to um, undergo a MRI scan, which we'll hear about in a bit, which you all um, did, to see whether that gave us extra information alongside the usual tests that people with diabetes have um, every year. So that included questions about how they were feeling, but also blood and urine tests. And we did the MRI scan at two different time points to see firstly whether there are any changes over time, but also to see how comparable um, that test was. But And we were also interested in whether people living with diabetes felt like the MRI was an acceptable tool in terms of how easy it was to, um, to do. So those were the sort of the, the thinking behind this study. Um, I'm going to hand back to Helena to talk a little bit more about the MRI scan itself. So thank you to all the participants yet again. So the participants who joined the study had two visits um, and in each of those visits uh, 
normal standard of care tests uh, were collected, in addition to filling in a questionnaire, but also having an MRI scan. At, um, the, the MRI scan was aimed at informing on the health of multiple organs. And we at Perspectum developed a standardized protocol. That means it would work consistently in different scanners. And the scan could measure and can measure the characteristics of multiple organs, the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, the kidneys, and as a measure of the heart, we also looked at how stiff the aorta, which is this connecting tube you can see uh, in pink at the bottom, um, is. This provided a total of 37 metrics from only a 30 minute scan time spent by each participant at each visit. At this webinar, we will describe the results for the liver. When a participant has the MRI, essentially we get a visual cross section across the liver, a slice. And we look at the level of fat, which is shown on the right at the top in white. It, um, the metric that results is called MRI PDFF, which stands for proton density fat fraction. And it's shown within that pink area in white. And we also get a measure of liver disease activity by another metric called CT1. Now, liver disease activity is actually a representation of the changes that occur in liver cells when the liver is stressed or damaged. For example, as a result of uh, a change in the metabolism or excess fat in the liver. We use sophisticated techniques and artificial intelligence to convert these images into numbers. And this enables us to quantify the health for the liver in this case. In Modify, we recruited 135 patients with type 2 diabetes. There were more males than females. The majority of the participants were white and they were older with established type 2 diabetes, which means that on average, the duration of the diabetes was for 11 years. Um, and another aspect of this is that everyone was on at least one medication for type 2 diabetes. The most common one was metformin, but also some of the newer expensive um, treatments used um, potentially in a more aggressive, uh, intense way to treat a patient like GLP-1 RAs or SGLT2s were also being used in this population, about a, a quarter or a third of the patients, depending on the treatment. So what were the results? Number one, um, what you can see here is an indication of the prevalence of excessive liver fat in the liver for the modified participants, starting from the top in the deepest color, the baseline, i.e. the values that participants came in at the beginning of the study, in the follow-up, in the next bar down, and then in controls matched for similar age or BMI or sex as the participants in the study, and again, compared to healthy controls at the very bottom. So what you can tell is that what we have found is that the prevalence of fat in the liver is quite high in the participants with type 2 diabetes. And this occurs at similar levels at both baseline and at the follow-up visit. Between the baseline and the follow-up, on average, it was seven months of time. So 70% of our 135 participants had values that were above the normal healthy range. Um, and 71% at the follow-up visit also had fat above the range. And then when we looked at liver disease activity, the numbers were lower, so 48% at, at baseline, sorry, and 49% at follow-up from the whole population of 135 had elevated CT1, an indicator of liver disease activity. And these numbers, again, were higher compared to the match controls and the healthy 
population that we use as controls. When you combine the information from the liver fat and the liver CT1, so the, these two slides I've just been talking about, this defines a level of liver disease known as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which, as you might imagine, is, is um, a clinical term that, in fact, describes the presence of both liver fat and changes in the cells in the liver that indicate there may be damage. And now I'm going to hand over to Dan, who's going to talk to you a bit more about what this actually means for the participants and for management of liver disease. Dan. Okay, thank you. Can you just go back to that last slide for one second? Thank you. That this one? I uh, know the one, Subsequent one, please. That's it. Perfect. Okay. So, um, thank you for for setting the scene, Helena and Gaia, uh, so nicely. But also a big thank you to all the participants who took part in in this study. And of course, without your input and guidance throughout, we couldn't have uh, achieved what we've achieved. The important thing now is obviously to feed this back not only to participants but to the public and. Also to healthcare providers, because there are some important messages about what we do for patients with diabetes, as you will see. So uh, if we can just go on to the, the next slide. Thank you. So I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes talking about this slide and just explaining what we're talking about. So uh, we, we've heard about this concept called fatty liver disease. So some of you may have been told that you have this already. If you've had your blood tests and your liver uh, function tests checked, it may have been noted that one of the blood enzymes was, was slightly abnormal. You may have even gone for an ultrasound scan where they find that you have a bright liver and so-called fatty liver. And it's often, unfortunately, dismissed as an insignificant finding. Uh, but it's an important clinical finding, as I'll show you. So. I'm just going to talk about this spectrum of disease, and this is the spectrum that we call non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's a lot of controversy about what we call this uh, this entity, if you like, because it, it's been suggested that it should be changed to metabolic liver disease based on the fact that it's highly related to uh, weight and to, to diabetes. But what essentially happens you start with a normal liver and then as people gain weight which we all unfortunately do particularly as we get older fat is deposited in various areas beneath the skin in part but it also spills over into the organs and the liver is one organ in which fat is deposited so when fat is deposited in the liver we get this uh, on the left you can see steatosis so this simply means uh, an accumulation of, of fat within the liver. Thank you. And in many people, that stays the same and may remain like that for, for a number of years. And this is important for a number of reasons. One, in people who don't already have diabetes, it increases their risk of going on to develop diabetes. But in fact, in those people that do have diabetes, it makes the diabetes more difficult to manage. It makes medication um, it makes people more resistant to the effects of medication and particularly if you're on insulin it often means that you need a higher dose of insulin so there are metabolic reasons why fat accumulation in the liver is is harmful but there's, there's more to it than that unfortunately because in a small proportion of people uh, this fat accumulation can actually progress and you can get what you what you're seeing in the middle part here steatosis and inflammation so you can get then uh, damage which helen has alluded to so inflammation within the liver cells the hepatocytes which grumbles on over again a number of years and this can progress to what's called nash which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis all of these changes may occur over many years and sometimes over decades so you have this spectrum that starts with a normal healthy liver without much fat or without any fat through to steatosis where there's fat accumulation 
through to inflammation and, and NASH. And then again, in a small proportion of people over many, many years, or as I've said, in decades, to scarring of the liver. And this is what you see here in the middle with fibrosis. So you'll notice that the liver is a bit smaller. It's irregular. It's, it's coarse in, in texture. And over a period, again, of years or decades, that can progress to end-stage liver disease cirrhosis. And so what we're now seeing, unfortunately, not just in people with diabetes, but people living with overweight or obesity, is an increased risk in people with uh, liver fibrosis and liver cirrhosis. And one of the end products of this, again, after many years, is the development of primary liver cancer. So these are, are only in small subsets of people after decades of liver injury. But this is a very common condition. So even with a very small proportion going on to develop these complications, it's a very important uh, consideration. So, so the important point here is the liver is an organ that is neglected in terms of, of diabetes care. So you, when you come to see Gaia or me or any of our colleagues will focus on your blood sugar management, your blood pressure, your cholesterol. We'll look at your eyes and your kidneys and your heart. But the liver, unfortunately, doesn't receive the attention it needs to um, receive. And we don't currently uh, screen for people with diabetes uh, for this condition, which we can do something about. Now, the, the arrows on here show that there is a progression from people with fibrosis to cirrhosis. But pleasingly and importantly, and I'll show you some evidence from even our study, this is an entirely preventable condition, an entirely reversible condition, and we can actually move the arrows the other direction so that we can reverse all these abnormalities. These are related in part to, to diet, to physical activity, but importantly, to diabetes management. And so there's a lot we can do to prevent this problem uh, from happening. And the, the middle of the slide just says this is reversible. That's a key point and a key takeaway message. Not everyone progresses in the same way or at the same uh, time scale. And often the changes that we see are over years, many years or even many decades. So next slide, please, Helena. Okay, thank you. So we know how important fat in the liver is from a number of studies. We've done a lot of work as a group ourselves, but you may have read about this study, which Professor Roy Taylor, who's shown on, on my right, and Mike Lean here, shown on the left, uh, have done in this study called DIRECT. And what DIRECT stood for was Diabetes Remission Clinical Trial. And Roy Taylor was really just testing the hypothesis, testing the idea that actually, rather than being inevitable and type 2 diabetes being something you can't do anything about, you can actually put it into remission. We don't use the word cure, but we use the word remission, which is essentially trying to get rid of your diabetes and get people off glucose lowering medication um, and, and having a very significantly reduced burden of complications. And so what Roy Taylor and Mike Lean did was they did this study called DIRECT, which basically allowed people with type 2 diabetes who were living with overweight or obesity to go on a low calorie diet. I won't go into the specifics of the intervention, but a very effective dietary intervention using a meal replacement program. And with that, the average weight loss over about 12 months was 10 kilos. So that's approximately, I think, about one and a half to two stone. So this is something that's very difficult to do by yourselves. It's very difficult to do uh, just with normal diet. But this, this uh, dietary intervention used a specific intervention. And it showed that if, they, if the patients were able to lose this amount of weight over a year, many of them, in fact, the vast majority of them, were able to reverse their diabetes and their diabetes would go into remission. And it wouldn't just stay in remission for a short time, it would stay uh, while they managed to lose the weight. And so what Roy did as part of the study, um, he did it in a, about 300 patients, but in a number of the 
the patients. They had scans very similar to the scans that the participants in our study had. It measured liver fat predominantly, but it also measured pancreatic fat. So you, all the participants in this study have had measurements of their liver and their pancreas fat. So we're just going to focus on the fat for the time being. And so what Roy demonstrated very clearly is that when people gain weight or when they lose weight, the amount of fat within the liver and the amount of fat within the pancreas determined how well people responded to diabetes medication, but also how well, it was, how well people responded to their own insulin levels. And so as liver fat went down very significantly, the body became more sensitive to the insulin. And with that, the diabetes literally disappeared. The, the pancreas also became more efficient at producing insulin and the liver was more responsive to the insulin. So what it very clearly showed is it's not simply about weight. Weight is important, but where you store the weight and where you deposit fat and within the liver and the pancreas are clearly very important. But the key message, I think, for patients here is that this is reversible with weight loss. Uh, next slide, please. So Guy has mentioned this already, but of course, there are lots of different uh, tablets and injections available to treat diabetes. So probably when Guy and I first started, when we were newly qualified uh, some years ago, I won't tell you how many years ago, uh, but some years ago, the, the medications that were available to us were very limited. And as you will see on the uh, left here in the purple box, the sulfonylureas, these are tablets like glyclozide, uh, TZDs, some of you may have been on some of these, so things like rosaglitazone as it used to be, um, pioglitazone was another one, but you'll see at the bottom there, insulin, a lot of these drugs actually promote weight gain. So while they're very, very useful for controlling the blood sugar, um, in many patients they may be still critical, um, so I wouldn't want anyone to stop these because of the weight gain, but they do improve blood sugars but at the expense of weight. And so that, apart from the sort of psychological and the, the physical effects, it does have an important uh, impact on the liver and often weight gain. Now on the right, where you see the weight loss in gray, you will see that actually some of the newer medications that are available, um, that some of you may have been treated with and some of the participants in this study were, uh, as Helen has alluded to, treated with, GLP-1 agonists, so this is often known as lizard spit to some patients. This was uh, an injection, or that there are a series of injections available. Um, it was originally isolated from lizard saliva, but it's been formulated over years into different formulations. The first one was probably exenatide that people may have come across. Liraglutide is another one, and then we've got semaglutide as a, the newest agent. So some of you may have been on that or those. And then SGLT2 inhibitors, these are tablets like dapagliflozin or empagliflozin that promote um, people basically weighing out extra uh, glucose. So these newer drugs are important because for the first time we've got drugs that target diabetes and blood sugar levels, but also promote weight loss. So bear in mind what I showed you with Roy Taylor Mike Lane study the critical uh, effect of, of weight on not just the liver and the pancreas, but on diabetes management, clearly drugs that promote weight loss rather than um, promoting weight gain are gonna be very beneficial. And I'll show you some examples in the next couple of slides. So Helen, if we could move on to the next slide. Yeah, so obviously here, there's no uh, mention of, of participant details, but this gives an example. Now, I'm just going to, again, give a little background to this. When we see patients through a normal NHS setting, we don't have uh, the facility to do on every patient these detailed MRI scans. We have a, a variety of different approaches that we can use. We have uh, blood tests that we can use that are somewhat limited. We can use an ultrasound. We can even use a device called the fibre scan that looks for scarring of the liver. And the MRI currently is predominantly a research tool, but it's a very sensitive tool at 
making the point that we want to make, which is that this is highly prevalent, a very common condition in patients with type 2 diabetes. And this just demonstrates this one example from a single patient of the effect that some of the diabetes treatment is having on people's liver health. So this is a 66-year-old uh, male who has a body mass index of 33. So people with obesity, living with obesity, will have a BMI over 30 kilogram per square meter. So this is based on weight and height. Now what you will see is this patient has had long-standing type 2 diabetes. So he was diagnosed 18 years ago. And in fact, he's on cholesterol tablets, but he was put on as normal care because we didn't interfere with the clinical care of patients in this study two different drugs. And these are the two uh, medications that I've alluded to that promote weight loss. And so what you can see here, I'm not sure which agents they were, but these were part of the SGLT2 inhibitor class, something like dapagliflozin, and part of the GLP-1 receptor agonist class, something like uh, liraglutide. And what, what you can see here is a measurement of the liver fat. So I've talked about steatosis earlier. I talked about being able to detect it on an ultrasound, but we're using a very sensitive technique with the MRI scan, and Helen has alluded to this and mentioned this measurement, PDFF, which is basically liver fat. Now, if I were to tell you that liver fat in, in a normal, healthy, normal weight, healthy person without diabetes, and this is a very contentious threshold, is about 5%. You can see that, as with many of our participants, there is a high level of liver fat. So this is around 43%. But we've put this, or this patient has commenced these different uh, medications. They've managed to lose probably a significant amount of weight, which you can see from the BMI going down from 33 to 27. And with that, the liver fat has completely normalized. So the, the scanner is partly color coded, but we also are able to measure exactly the liver fat measurement, which is numerically presented there. And you can see that with the effects of these medications, we're able to normalize the liver fat. Now that has implications for a number of reasons, because firstly, that means that the diabetes is much easier to control. It may have even gone into remission, but it also means for that particular individual, then their risk of perhaps chronic liver disease and this condition called NAFLD uh, over, if they're able to maintain this liver health over the next five, 10, 20 years, their risk of liver related complications, that spectrum that I showed you is significantly reduced. So that can only be good news. If we go on to the next slide, thank you. So this, again, is just demonstrating in a different person um, just the same issue, that looking at liver health with these more sensitive techniques, we can measure not just the liver fat, but also scarring within the tissues. So this is looking at both the liver here on the left with the, the scarring, which is essentially the CT1 measure that you see on the MRI, but also scarring in the kidneys and we know that patients with diabetes are more likely to get um, chronic kidney disease and kidney damage, we can pick these up at an earlier point. Now, the important point that you will notice here, that some of the blood tests that we will often use to screen for, for liver or for uh, kidney complications are in fact normal. So we've got very sensitive techniques to pick up these conditions early, but also to demonstrate the impact of some of the changes that perhaps medication may be uh, able to, to induce, but also lifestyle changes, weight loss with diet or with increased physical activity that can influence patients' long-term outcome. So I think there's, there's a one more slide. Right, so if I can just go back there. So what I hope I have done there is demonstrated that there is a problem in our population, not, not just in people with diabetes, but people who are living with overweight or obesity, and the health of their liver, which is unfortunately going unrecognized 
we have tools that we can use to screen for this. This isn't the MRI scan, but uh, the MR may be part of the solution in years to come. Um, that that we can that we can detect at an early point before complications arise. But most importantly, that with good diabetes control, with careful attention to uh, physical activity levels and maintenance as much as possible of weight, we can prevent some of these these complications. But importantly an important use of some of these newer diabetes drugs can influence the outcome of this. And what we hope we will be able to do is to really uh, highlight the public health issues, not just for people with diabetes, but for many of the other populations that we've seen this sadly in, in young people, uh, in children even now. And we really need to wake up, I think, as society to recognize the impact that liver health may have on, on the future of not just children, but patients like yourselves, and even people like me, Helena and Gaia, who may also be affected, but we can do something about this. So I'm gonna conclude there, and of course we'll answer questions, but I think Helena's got the acknowledgements to disclose. Yeah, so we've got, so this, this uh, study was a wonderful collaboration between Liverpool, Oxford, and London, uh, clinical sites, as you can see, the University of Liverpool Hospital, uh, NHS Foundation Trust, the Oxford University Hospitals, and the Royal Free London Hospital Foundation Front Trust. Sorry, the Spectrum provided the uh, MRI and the MRI processing, and we also collaborated with I Want Great Care, who uh, helped us develop the questionnaires that all participants gave, um, and of course, Innovic UK. This uh, was uh, a wonderful study that Innovate UK partially funded due to a joint grant we all put together. So thank you to everyone who took part and especially the study participants. Obviously, we would have zero to say today without uh, everyone's participation. Thank you very much. The idea is that we're going to have further studies to sh show the results on each of the other organs that we measure and to also go over um, the, the data from the questionnaires regarding uh, the care pathway itself as it is at the moment and how uh, patients experienced MRI. So we'd like to hear more and I think Diana has been fielding questions uh, throughout this webinar. So if I'll just give everyone a few minutes to send any questions they might have. But I thought I'd let you know that we are um, continuing and doing more studies in patients with type 2 diabetes, including ones that uh, perhaps allow uh, patients to give feedback on what reports look like uh, from the MRI scans to make them more patient friendly. Um, and also uh, for follow-up for MRI scans for participants in this study and uh, new participants in other studies. Diana? Yeah, we've got a few questions. Um, we'll start off with quite an interesting one here. It says, can you have fat on the organs without being overweight? Yeah. yeah. Is okay. A... Sorry. So, I mean, I can answer that. that that's a very good question. And um, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about that. Unfortunately, yes, you can. And so, one of the one of the uh, problems is that it's called fatty liver disease. But of course, about 10 to 15 percent of people who have fatty liver disease are of normal weight, and that's unfortunately well recognised. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. There may be underlying genetic reasons. There are certain genetic uh, risk factors that uh, are associated with this. But it may just be the way that people are made up and the way that they store uh, fat. And what we also know is that in people um, from ethnic minority groups, South Asians, for example, are much more likely to deposit fat in their organs at a lower body mass index than, say, white Europeans or even than black African uh, Caribbean people. So, so there is clearly genetic reasons. There are ethnic reasons as well 
but some people uh, will just deposit fat within their organs more readily. And in fact, this has been recognized and the same group that are doing the direct study, which recruited people who were living with overweight or obesity, are now doing um, a study in people with normal weight diabetes based on the fact that if they've got diabetes, they probably have high liver fat to start with. And so what they're now, they've presented the results of this this year. And again, people with normal weight, but with high liver fat, who go on this kind of dietary intervention approach are able to get their diabetes into remission. So it's unfortunately well recognized and becoming more and more recognized as time goes on. So that's a very good question, but very relevant. And unfortunately, the answer is yes. So I hope that answered that. Can I, can I just add as well, that was a really good question, that the tools that we have to measure fat uh, or in, in the liver really do rely on having sort of um, sensitive ways of looking at it like the MRI or ultrasounds even which is a relatively crude and the way that we think about weight and being overweight when we think about just either getting on the scales or even a BMI which is a measure of your height and your weight sort of correlated it they, they really only give us a very sort of crude measure of our of, of our weight and really where we put our weight has huge implications for health so actually if you're someone that stores your fate your fat in organs that's probably worse for you than if you fall you store your fat under your skin so there's there's quite a lot of research going on into that as well and that's a really useful question but probably the treatments are still the same around sort of as, as dan talked about trying to reduce fat um, and losing weight even if you are normal bmi Can I just also make the point about the tools, and guys touched upon this important point. So when you go and measure liver fat clinically, it, you need a much higher level of liver fat mm. to be visible for mm. it to show up on an, on an ultrasound mm. scan, for mm. example. So these are very sensitive tools that we are using to pick this up. Um, so we, we can't necessarily say we, we can say for the people who have taken part in this study, but let's suppose someone went for an ultrasound and had uh, a finding of a normal liver fat or the, a normal liver, it wouldn't necessarily mean that their liver fat wasn't raised. It would just mean it's not significantly raised. So the tools that we have um, currently are very blunt, and that again was the point of the study, but there are more sensitive tools available to pick up disease early and to influence treatment. We've got a few questions about um, having access to MRI scans for the liver. Things like, where can I get my liver scan? So I assume that those are um, people that didn't take part in the study who've also joined us today. Um, Helena, do you want to? So, um, so the so Perspectum provide um, the digital solutions. And it's all based on MRI. The, there are different practices throughout the UK that actually use um, these methods. And we'd be happy to provide you with the location of where you could have one. Um, and that, there's an email on the slide that you can see called contact, for contact, sorry, patients at perspectum.com. So that's, uh, if you'd like to get a straight answer of exactly where, you can get the, it's called the liver multi-scan if you want to look at the results of your liver, but um, I'm sure we'll understand whatever your question is. So the answer is yes, you can have it. There are specific sites that where the clinicians make this available. Please contact us for more information. Can I just add a, a, an NHS perspective on this? Yes, so, please, yeah. yeah, so I think what we are showing here is gold standard. This is like the Rolls-Royce scan, I think it would be fair to say. Um, this is probably the best equivalent to a liver biopsy, which is of course a, a horrible and invasive procedure, not without risk. Um, but these techniques are generally not available 
and that they've been put forward through NICE, in fact, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and then they're, they're not relevant as a first port of call. So, so they can be used in research studies, but they're not going to be a relevant so solution for the population because this is a very common condition. It's common in about, oh, it's present in about 30% of the general population. So we can't be putting people through MRI scans. But there are different approaches that, that we can adopt in the general population or in patients with diabetes that we are not yet doing. Part of that is doing simple screening tests. There are different ones that your GP can do. And if you score above a certain level, you can then go and have an ultrasound or a fibre scan. And based on the results of that, you would then be referred up and further evaluation. So, so this is not a technique, unfortunately. There may be access around Oxford or other parts of the country, but it, for, for most patients across the UK, this is not yet uh, something that we can roll out on a population basis. The NHS is facing a massive backlog, but it does highlight what, with technology, we can see about people's health that are, are not currently available in, in routine sort of clinical pathways. Yes, that's right. So it's not in the guidelines, but it is available at certain sites because some clinicians are using it already. Um, any other questions? Yeah, the final final one I'll put to um, the panel is um, people are asking about where they can find out more about the direct study. I believe that's on the Di uh, Diabetes UK website. Yeah, I think so. The direct study. I was, trying, I was trying to find the name of the the, the new study, which I forget uh, what it's called now. But I was uh, I can send it in due course. The direct study, to be honest, has been very very well publicised, and mm. the initial study was called Counterbalance, um, yeah. which goes back about eleven years, and that this was a small study, but the direct study was two point four million pounds. And it was the largest study Diabetes UK ever funded. So I think if you look on Diabetes UK website, it will be uh, up there. Um, there is now, as I say, this rollout, and this has really changed practice because now this dietary intervention, which is the total diet replacement, is being rolled out across the UK, pilot schemes and various centres across the UK. So there's a lot now around the direct study and the implications to, to practice. So, so I think if you go on Diabetes UK website, you will find, I'm sure, a huge amount about this. But there is a study website as well. I can just read it out for you if you want, which is www.directclinicaltrial, so without any spaces, .org.uk. And what's, when I, I often, Point patients it, there's a resources section which has actually got some uh, study information not translated but written in very sort of patient friendly terms around the results of the study and also different resources so different diets because it was quite an intensive um, program that participants went through in terms of calorie restriction so it was an 800 calorie per day diet that the participants went through. And so there were different patient resources around how to um, how to do that. Uh, so I, I, I've used that website before and it's, it's really the resources section tab uh, that's probably most helpful. I would also just say, um, and this is a study that was done in people without diabetes, but living with obesity. There was a study from Oxford, actually, Susan Jeb called Droplet. Mm. And and this adopted a similar approach, but but looked at mainly weight change. So um, the important point, I suppose, is you know all all these uh, interventions will influence not just your liver but your general health in in mm. overall terms. And this is something that not necessarily the diets themselves, but definitely dietary advice around low calorie diets that you can access on the NHS. So actually lots of different dietitians within primary and secondary care will support patients with type 2 diabetes to follow this sort of pathway. That, that's been 
funded by NHS England. I think for, for many of the patients on the, the call too, we talked about some of these newer diabetes medications. So these are in the news a lot because they're, some of them are in short supply. But, you know, it's worth discussing with your practice nurse or your GP whether you would be eligible for these because there's very good evidence that they could be used in patients at a much earlier point than they used to be used. And although Helena said they're expensive, um, they are now endorsed by various societies as not quite a first line, but certainly in people with high risk of heart disease or with certain conditions uh, as a much earlier treatment option so the cost becomes irrelevant really so so it's worth just thinking about what your medication consists of currently and whether you would be someone that could be uh, considered for one of these new i say newer drugs they've been around five to ten years but they're new in in the history of diabetes medication um, yeah, sticking with um, uh, research, there's a question on how and where will the results of Modify be published? Okay, um, so obviously it's an important... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, how you can hear me. Um, so it's important to us to publish the results. So we are working on four separate scientific manuscripts at the moment as a team. Um, we hope to submit them before uh, Christmas and then sometime mid next year, all, all, all being well, they will get published. So if anyone wants to hear, sorry, wants to receive um, a copy of the publication on the whole study, please again contact us and we can send it to you. And equally, uh, at least for the liver data, uh, we can uh, supply results individually um, because the, the liver results are prepared in a report format anyway, which we um, aim to make as patient friendly as possible as kind of an ongoing thing. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, again, please let us know. And what would happen then is you would be uh, given the opportunity to, 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 to have a clinician go over your report um, to help explain it to you. But essentially, the advice will be as Dan and Guy have described already in terms of management. Can I, can I also just add one thing? If anyone would like to be involved in any further um, applications that we may be able to put in, it would be very useful if two or three people would be happy to, to be contacted and be involved because of course it's fine us talking about the liver health and diabetes but we don't currently live with diabetes and so it's very important that we hear from the patients, the people whose lives are affected by these conditions and guide us and really steer some of the research questions yeah. and, and give us some indication of, of what matters to you because what matters to clinicians and what matters to patients are very different. So if anyone wants to be involved in that, if they could let uh, Diana or Helena or use the email there, uh, let us know that would be very, very useful. Um, and what we also want to do is we want to move the conversation on, having highlighted some of the issues to actually change practice. That's really the ultimate goal of this, to say, well, look, the liver is currently neglected, let's do something about this and incorporate some of these measures, not necessarily an MRI scan, but that may be a, an option in uh, selected people. But let, let's start to look at this and evaluate liver health as part of diabetes screening. So that's a really important point that we wish to take forward from this study and the, the publications that may ensue from it. Yeah. Um, any more questions? I, I think they've been covered in the answers particularly it's great to have that direct trials information information yeah okay great was it? thank you for that all right so i think one more thank you to all the participants and everyone who's tuned in today we are recording this webinar for the people who registered but didn't attend and we are as i mentioned at the beginning we're holding more webinars to, to 
describe the results uh, of our findings in each of the other organs from, again, from the same study, because it's a, a very um, rich study with lots of data, too much for one session. So thank you again very much, and thank you to Dan, Gaia, and Diana. Um, have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.